Hey there, welcome to a breaking news edition of the Run In Place podcast. I'm Kareth Burke with Grant Liffman. We also have Kalena Azabuki. Thank you for joining us. And it's breaking news because things are happening so quickly in the NBA right now. I want to let you know, because things are happening so quickly, we are recording this podcast Wednesday at about four o'clock. So what has already happened is that the Bucks and the Magic took the floor for game five, but right after warmups, the Bucks decided we're not going to play in this game. And they walked out. And that started um, what's being called a boycott. Um, I had to learn some of the terminology, actually. It's officially a strike. A strike is when you withhold labor. A boycott is when you withhold money, for example, if you're a consumer. So just to talk about this moment in history, history we should really refer to it as a strike. And this set off a a chain of events, a bunch of dominoes in the NBA. Um, NBA Communications explained that, you know, now that this Bucks and Magic game is postponed, the other games this evening, Houston and OKC, and then the Lakers and the Blazers are postponed as well. The expectation in this moment is that these game fives will be rescheduled. But things are also moving very quickly. And Kalena, it really seemed like players reached an emotional tipping point about whether they should be playing right now. And, and how they use their platform to react to racism and police brutality. What do you think about this tipping point? The players are fed up. I have so many emotions. The players are definitely fed up. They're tired of seeing black people dying at the hands of cops. I applaud their heart behind it, for sure. I have a lot of the same sentiments. The thing I hope is that action comes out of it. Like something happens. We've been saying, let's keep the conversation going. I'm tired of talking. I feel like I've done a lot of talking about the issues. I want to see something happen. I want to see some action. And not sure what needs to happen to make more action happen. But I just know I just want to see some action and Listen, the, the Jacob Blake thing. Can I can I address that? Just what I oh, think of. Of course, yeah. Let's make this a conversation. Yeah, I'm sorry. You just said we need to have a moment of awareness too. We are two of your yeah. white colleagues asking you to explain your pain, your anguish. You have been talking about this on Race in America. You were talking about this before. I almost feel like we need owe you an apology that we're bringing you on again to kind of excavate, you know, this grief and anger. Um, but thank you for your willingness to join us. So, so please, um, if you'd like, please go ahead and talk about Jacob Blake. No problem. Yeah, from, from the cop side of things, seven shots, seven shots in the back after George Floyd. This is a world after George Floyd, riots, protests, and you're a cop and you shoot him in the back seven times. And I've talked about police reform, and I'm still harping on that. There needs to be extensive police reform. Like, I don't care if the man you're trying to subdue is walking away, if he's resisting, if he has a knife. There has to be a, way, a better way to deal with this. Um, a way that requires less force. I've always thought cops should know jujitsu or some form of martial arts so they can deal with these situations more efficiently, but it's ridiculous. And I, and I asked the question to, to people I talked to, if, if it was a white person in the same situation and the cop was trying to subdue a white person, does it end with him getting shot seven times in the back? And I think most of us can say no. I think the answer is probably no. So there has to be a better way. I've, I've talked about police reform when it comes to better screening processes to make sure you, the bad apples don't get in, in the first place better accountability, the partners of whoever the bad cop is has to do a better job of of trying to regulate the situation and make him stop whatever he's doing that's that's wrong. There has to be a better way of handling this if you're cops. And there's so many good cops out there and this is making it so much worse for them because now what good people really wanna be cops? Cops are, are, are hated probably more than they ever have been. They don't get paid a lot. It's a dangerous job. And so we're making it tougher to get good people in that position, in that position of power to handle these crazy dangerous situations. And so 
there has to be so much police reform. And I just feel like I'm so tired of seeing this happen. And, and then the other side, okay, so I've talked to black friends and, and black friends that have children. And if I had children, this is what I would say to them. And this is, this is a big part of it to me. My black brothers and sisters, we have to have a mentality of live to see another day at all costs. Live to see another day. If I have my kids and I'm talking about this issue, I'm telling them, if you get pulled over, obey. Don't resist. Don't make any sudden moves. Don't walk away. Don't do anything. If the cop pulls his gun on you, I don't care if it's a, a um, unreasonable arrest, wrongful arrest, whatever it is, if you encounter a cop, obey. Why are we testing? We don't want to test and see if he's racist. We don't want to test and see if he's had a bad day or if he woke up on the wrong side of it. We don't want to know that. And the best way to avoid that is to obey. Don't make any sudden moves. The cop has his gun pulled on, on you. Don't walk away. Just stop. Lay down. Do whatever the cop says. I don't want to see any more black people die. I don't want to see it. And, and we've watched videos and it's been proven that there are cops out there that will kill black people. And sometimes it doesn't take much. We know this. I don't want to see any more martyrs to, to, to push this conversation along or to bring about more action. We have to stay alive. We have to do a better job of staying alive. And, and, and I'm heartbroken because this keeps happening and there's so many people that are just angry and I want it to stop. I want it to stop. And, and it's hard to talk about because it seems like no matter what you say, there's people on both sides that are just like, everybody's so angry and it's, you're not going to please anybody, but this is how I feel. And both sides of this are equally important. Police side of it, there has to be reform. We have to make changes on that side. The, the police unions and the good cops have to come forward and, and bring about change. The higher ranking officers, the police departments, people in charge, there has to be something done about this. There is a problem, right? We don't want to see any more black people dying. It's not, it's not right. It's not right. And you have to be outraged seeing these videos and seeing them continue to happen over and over again. There's no way you're a human being and, and you're not upset by this. And then the other side of it, we have to stay alive. My black brothers and sisters, we have to stay alive. If you have kids, I implore you to tell them how to act, how to behave and make sure they obey the law, be a law abiding citizen, be a law abiding citizen. And whenever you encounter a cop, don't do any, make, don't make any sudden moves. Don't walk away. Just obey, just obey. And, Listen, um, it's not easy to talk about because obviously at times it seems like even that's not enough, right? Even if you do obey, even if, if um, you do everything you're supposed like to do, everything the cop says to do, it can still happen. And that's, that's a big issue. I feel like some communities are policed differently. The black community is policed differently. And I hear everything you're saying about obey or having the talk with your children. I see that as a protective response from people who do not want to be murdered. I would like to say, and maybe phrase it differently, that the onus on black people, the onus is not on black people not to be murdered. The onus is on police to de-escalate and make sure, sure they're not bringing a bias into these interactions with the citizens that they must serve and protect. Definitely. And that's, that to me is, is everything. The de-escalation training, psychological training, all the dangerous incidents that these cops have to deal with, that stuff should be mandatory. Mandatory. You can't expect these cops to go into these situations and not have the proper training and <laughs> Maybe there's some of them that are racist. Maybe there's some of them that just have other mental issues, whatever the case is. But this can't keep happening. And I've been harping on police reform, police reform, 
And I want to see it. I want to see it because it didn't have to end that way. I truly believe it didn't have to end that way. There's things, more things coming out about Jacob Blake and everything. He had a knife. They tried to tase him. They're fighting him on the ground and all this different stuff. But despite all that, it didn't have to end with seven shots to the back and this man paralyzed with his kids in the car. It's, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And any good cop, reasonable cop can see that and, and understand that there is an issue there, a big problem. So that's how I feel about it. And obviously it's complicated and the, the racial injustice, there's a lot of different aspects of it, but one thing's for sure, something needs to change and action needs to happen. We need to see action. I mean, it's, it's difficult listening to what you're saying because, you know, the onus is sure on police. And uh, I think the onus really is on, I mean, white people to change what's going on because black people can only say so much. They're the ones that are being terrorized right now. And to see what's happening, the climate in America, and yet, as you were saying, to then have this still happen shows that there's something ingrained systemically in there to allow a situation like that to happen that not even the climate of today changed that cop or those cops' mindset to still shoot a black man in the back seven times. So obviously what is happening right now hasn't gotten through to a lot of people. So you look at what the NBA is doing and, and some people would say, oh my God, that's so dramatic and drastic to boycott or strike as characters saying these games. But I mean, what is the limit of what needs to be done at some point? What, how do you respond to something? And Kalena, obviously you don't have an answer for everybody, right? But I'm oh. sure you've thought about this and I'm sure, I, I'm sure I'm guessing that you do agree with what these NBA players and teams are doing right now. For sure. And to me, it's a heart issue. How do you change someone's heart? How do you change the way someone looks at a situation? We know there's people out there that looked at the George Floyd thing and they're like, I don't, I'm not listening to all these. It's BS. He was this, this, this. And they just, they just look at it through a different lens. And we're trying to get to those people and be like, come on, you know, where's your humanity? You know what I mean? But there's still people that feel that way. It's like, it's a heart issue. And I know only God can change someone's heart, but all we can do is continue to harp on it. And that's why I say, I, you know, I applaud the heart behind what the players are doing because they're fed up man. they're fed up and they're in the bubble. And that's already stressful. Just being there, not able to be around family. And then this happens and they're, they're doing a great job letting their voices be heard. They've been talking about this, a bunch of players have been talking about this every game, the injustice happening, they're fighting for equality. And then this happens. Of course, they're just like, come on, dude. I mean, what have we been doing in here? What have we been talking about? Is no one listening? Is no one listening to us? And, and, and the, the hard issue too with that cop that, I think it was maybe two of them that shot him, but those cops, obviously it didn't get through to them. Obviously, they weren't listening. So what is the solution? We just have to keep, you know, I've been, I've been trying to do my part. We've been, you know, I, I wrote up a list of things that I think should happen with police reform. I talked about uh, community engagement, having mandatory outreach to where the, the cops that are protecting certain communities have to, to go and reach out to the kids in that community and do drive uh, have them come and do drive alongs and, and actually see what they go through, build a relationship, have, have game day where they're having to play games and play basketball with the people in the community, just so they build some kind of relationship, just so there's not that distrust and that disconnect. And every time a cop comes by, it's for something negative. It shouldn't be that way. There needs to be a relationship, but there's, there's all kinds of things that need to happen, but they need to happen. You know what I mean? They need to happen. And again, with the players uh, doing what they did today, I just hope action comes out of it. Some kind of action, because they're gonna go back in a few days and, and play. 
So do you think they will? I think it's going to, I think they're going to keep playing at some point. I think they're going to get back to playing. What I, do you doubt think the, I doubt the season is over right now. Hmm? I, I actually, I think, I do. I do. I don't think Grant does, but I do. Because what I'm struggling with is how do you emotionally come back from this? Because the players are in a position of power. They're withholding their labor right now. So there has to be a reason for that. There would have to be a reason for them to come back. At this moment, we don't know if the players have gotten together with a list of demands. We don't know if players are working with cities. This feels like a really important emotional response. But what, what would it take to, to get them back on the court. Maybe having, having those cops arrested, Breonna Taylor, you know, Do something you think needs to happen. happen? There. I, don't, I don't know. But I, I just feel like at some point the players are going to come back and I feel like they're going to try to finish the season. But yeah. it's not just enough to, to arrest the cops. Like we can't just keep having this happen and then, you know, outcry and riots happen and then they arrest the cops and it happens again it's not we have to change the system it's systemic and there's so many different things that need to be changed and it's such a big task and it's going to take so many people in positions of power to do it and i just think right now it's it's so heavy and it's going to continue to be heavy but I don't know. Maybe the players do sit out. I just feel like at some point they'll probably get back to playing. But action, action, man. That's what they're calling for. We're demanding change, justice. Um, the injustice has is, is reached a tipping point. We don't want to see this happen ever again. And that's my heart behind me saying what I would say to my kids. And not just kids, to grown-up black people too. That's what I, you know, we got to do our best. Given this situation, us knowing that there's racist cops out there, us knowing that there are cops that will kill a black man for, you know, we just have to, we just have to try to stay alive, try to stay alive. Um, Which is that, that but, that's, but, that's the sickening part. It's, it's sickening yeah. to hear that. that that's the actual that, I have to have, yeah. that I have to have that conversation with my kids you know, when I have kids and other black people have to have that conversation and we have to talk to ourselves about it. Just like we're dealing with this situation and we know it is right now. And that's what we have to tell ourselves. It's ridiculous, but it is reality. And I don't want to see any more black people die. And so I'm thinking, okay, what, what, what could maybe, like what could we do to to stay alive better, for lack of of a better way to say it? And and it's ridiculous that we we have to have this conversation, but you know, that's what it is. You know, obey and and do everything we can. You know, sometimes that's not enough, but that's the best chance we have, and that's the truth. You know, any black person that doesn't want to hear that and is angry, I'm angry too, but I don't want to see you die. You know, that's what I would say to my black friends, and and we've had that conversation. Everybody that I've talked to. They were saying the same stuff, but on the other side of it, police reform has to happen. Um, people in positions of power have to use that power for good and, and fight this fight with us. It's a war on racism. It's a war against injustice. And um, we need more people fighting. We need more people in positions of power that um, have the power to bring about change, to use that, use that power and get in there and do it. Because what kind of action, what does this achieve? What is the best way to explain like the escalation here? Because the players had, you know, Black Lives Matter t-shirts, it's on the courts, they can wear slogans on their jersey. They were pre-approved, of course, but this is, an ex this is something that caught the NBA by surprise, according to Woj. They had no idea this was going to happen. It seemed like players really reached that tipping point and they took action, which we keep coming back to, action, action, action. What does this accomplish? How would you, would you explain this moment in NBA history? I would just say, I think a lot of the players are really frustrated because they've been doing a lot of talking, right? They've been doing a lot of talking, written things on their shirts, 
the back of their jerseys, equality, all these different things. And then this happens. And it's like, as a human, you want to maybe not assume, but just hope that what you're doing is helping the situation and, and maybe making things better. And people are seeing what you're trying to do and maybe uh, being called to action, feeling obligated to take action and something is happening. And then this happens and then the players are like, really? And I think it's just frustration. And so I think that's kind of what the players are realizing. Like all of our talk and everything we've been saying in here and everything we've written and what's written on the court is that helping? Is that helping? And I would be frustrated if I was in there saying all that stuff. And right now they just don't want to play. And it makes sense. Everybody's outraged. Everybody's mad right now. Everybody's angry, heartbroken, horrified. I'm all those things. What's it going to take? You know, we need, we need action, people in power, you know, um, I have police friends that I've been calling, getting their perspective. And there's so many issues. There's so many issues with police departments. Um, some of them have said they're, they're underfunded. Um, the system is set up to where it's more likely that undertrained maybe bad people get in and end up as cops. Uh, maybe the train, the training I was talking to one, he said the training is way too easy. When I got in, it was way more extensive, way tougher to be a cop. And when I became a cop, I was well equipped. Now they're undermanned. They're making it easier to get in because they're undermanned, underpaid, more dangerous, it's like, what is that going to, what's going to be the result of that? It's not going to make anything better. You know, so there's so many different issues there. And that's a really interesting point And one that I don't think I've heard a lot in this, in this discussion about the I'm hardships. Talking. Well, because when you talk about police brutality, your first inclination is not to talk about the hardships of police. Right. To have a full round picture here. That's, that's an interesting point about, who is becoming a cop and, and the resources that they have. Um, because I would like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. So yeah. Glenna, um, I want to echo a fear of mine uh, and, and hear your thoughts about it because you talked about what action can be taken. That's enough, right. To have these guys play again, right. What, what could be said or done that would make these guys be like, Oh, now it's worth playing basketball again. And you know, you could say, oh, we're going to arrest the cops that killed Breonna Taylor, the rest of the cops that shot. Um, and I just, I wonder, is there even a tangible, <laughs> even worthy thing that could happen that makes this worth, you know, coming back and now accepting that their voices are being heard? Because a lot of this stuff is going to take so much time. We're talking hundreds of years even to get where we are now, which is the sickening yeah. part. So. Yeah inaction is just and nothing's happening at a at a federal level because there's just the amount of inaction there so it's just it's alarming to me that it's hard to even pinpoint what we can say is substantial enough to say something good is happening right now yeah before i would say the best thing that could have happened was these protests to see people coming together and actually standing up and i'm actually i'm inspired by the fact these nba players are you know, striking because I mean, at least people are getting together and trying to do something. Right. But as you were saying, what is enough to then be like, Oh, I'm glad ch change is actually happening. That that's, that's my fear of uh, just, there is no answer to that. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough to pinpoint one thing that needs to happen. Like I said, even if arrests happen in this case, Breonna, Breonna Taylor's case, it's still not enough. Maybe some players will look at that and go, okay, let's come back and play now, but let's keep talking. Let's keep it in people's faces. Let's keep protesting while we play. Maybe not. And I understand 
both both sides of it as a player. But honestly, you're you're trying to fight the feeling of hopelessness, right? Because all those things you've talked about were great. The protests, people coming together. I saw more and heard more white people talking about this than I think I ever have. My white friends uh, just listening, right? Just listening, expressing sympathy, understanding more, almost having epiphanies, like, oh, this is what they're talking about. That is kind of messed up. No, it's not kind of messed up. It's really, really messed up. And, and there's more and more, not just white people, people of all races coming together. And it's a beautiful thing, beautiful pictures all across, not just the US, the globe. And, and other leagues, not just the NBA, protesting and, you know, football and global sports everywhere. You've seen beautiful pictures of people coming together of all races to fight this thing. And then this happens and you're like, you're fighting hopelessness. You're fighting the feeling of hopelessness, like all that, all of those things that happen, all those beautiful pictures people coming together, excluding the looting and the opportunists that are screwing things up and not helping us, excluding that, the peaceful protests is beautiful. And then this happens. So uh, I don't know if any one person has all the answers, but I know everybody can just kind of look in the mirror and, and try to figure out if they're doing all they can, right? in their sphere of influence, right? The power that they have, are they doing all they can? Are they listening, talking to people? Keeping the conversation going is important, but again, I wanna see action. I wanna see action and that's the action and change is not gonna come about until people in power actually take the onus upon themselves and say, okay, I have this position. I need to take advantage of this. I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something big. And I guess if anyone knows someone in power, implore them to do that, right? Implore them to do that. And, and listen, you're, you're this, this, and this, whatever position you are. Come on, we need your help, man. Like, beg for them to do that. And that's what needs to happen. And Kalena, within the framework of the NBA, I keep thinking about sacrifice. It is a big deal to strike when the NBA puts so much momentum into rebooting, when they are putting so much into trying to crown a champion this season. Like this, this is professional sacrifice. I, I was struck by something that the Bucks sideline reporter Zora Stevenson said um, when she explained, what are you going to give up? And for a player like Giannis, who just got defensive player of the year. Um, you know, he's in the hunt for a championship. He's in the hunt for an MVP. You know, those are professional accolades, but things that are very important to a competitor. They had a chance to, to clinch game five today to move on to the next round of playoffs. And they said, no, there are bigger things right now. You know, and, and Giannis was a part of that, the whole team. Um, remember Sterling Brown? Um, his, he wrote for the Players' Tribune about his interaction with police. He also said in that story his father was a cop. Um, the Clippers coach, Doc, Doc Rivers, his video that has traveled around the world today, he explained his father is a cop. There are so many emotions at play here. You can be on, and you can have the understanding that it's not anti-police to want the police to be better. It's a very important institution in America. You want to see it be its best. Sure. Sorry, going back to the sacrifice, because there are critics of NBA players saying like, well, what does this do? You're already a millionaire. It's all performative. It's not. To stop working, to send a message that the nation sees we're fed up, that's a big deal. So I know it's happening within sports, but why is sports one of those vehicles for these kind of meaningful conversations and actions that the players have taken? Thanks. Sports is so important to the fabric of, of our society, of every society. Just the fact that it brings people together. I've seen that. Um, I remember taking a trip to Israel. 
And Israel is a place that is really divided. Walls separating communities, neighborhoods, because of religion, because of ancient fights for land. Who owns this land? There's walls up and there's all kinds of separation. People that live two blocks down that have never seen each other because there's a wall up. And we go in there, I go in with the NBA and we do a basketball camp. And all these kids from all these different communities come together. Kids that have never seen each other. Again, because there's a wall up in a neighborhood, you know, a neighbor that should have been hanging out with the person that lives three doors down has never seen it because of, of this dispute, because of this wall, because of religion, because of whatever, right? And we do a basketball camp and all these kids come out and play with each other and they get along and they realize the person on the other side of the wall isn't so bad. We're having fun together. They're not so different than me. And it's because of sports, because of a, a basketball camp, a ridiculous little basketball camp. Where we're just doing drills and, and messing around and, and playing, you know, little games here and there, shooting games. And that brought people together. And that's just a small example. And that's, that's sports. Um, if you look at just the picture that you see every time you watch an NBA game, all kinds of different races out there just fighting with each other. We're all brothers. We all we got, right? This is a family. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what religion you are. I don't care what you believe. I don't care where you came from. You're my brother. And let's go out and get these buckets together. Let's go beat these dudes. You know what I mean? And that, that unity is what we want to see in the world. And it's a beautiful picture we see every time we watch sports. That's what we want our society to be. That's what we want the U.S. to be. That's what we want every country to be like. That kind of equality. It's, it's just a normal thing in sports. And they don't even have to try. It's just normal. And so that alone, just getting to see that and that example that sports gives us as human beings, gives the world, is so essential. And that's one of the reasons I love watching. Like, forget the highlights, forget the dunks, forget everything else, everything else we love about basketball or any other sport. The unity you see out there, white, black, yellow, doesn't matter. We're all just teammates. You're just my teammate, and you're my brother, and I love you, and we're going to go play. It's, it's beautiful. So, to me, that's, that's why sports is so important. And um, these social issues and you know, people want to talk about, well, sports should be an escape. We shouldn't have to talk politics and all these different things. This isn't politics. We're just humans. And we saw something that's very angering and upsetting. And it has to be talked about. So anyone that sees this podcast or sees the NBA talking about it, play-by-play -play guys, color guys, athletes, the players out there, reporters talking about this issue. And if they say, man, I can't lose, I, I need to turn this off. You should ask yourself why. You should really ask yourself, why does this offend me? Why am I upset that they're talking about this? You know, we all need to be part of the solution. We need to be part of the solution and look ourselves in the mirror and figure out if we're doing everything we can to, to be part of the solution and bring about change. So, you know, Glenna, I really, really truthfully uh, appreciate you coming on with us. And I'm sure you, it must be absolutely exhausting emotionally, everything uh, for you to have to always constantly talk about this because it's something that, you, okay, of course, as you said, you want to see actual action happen from it. Mm -hmm. um, just, I, I just want to know, you know, there's going to be a lot of question marks about what the players should do next within the NBA. Do they keep the strike going? Do they come back and play? Um, you know, everyone has an opinion about it and it really comes down to what the players want. But the problem is, and Kareth and I spoke about this before we came on with you, is that there's just so much pressure on these players. If you think about the amount of money that is at stake, the amount of jobs that are at stake, it's not just the players, right? So if they stop playing, a lot of people that aren't making $20 million a year, they're also losing their jobs, you know, et cetera. That's we sort pressure. of talks about the unfairness of the situation right. and what the players are, are putting on their shoulders in this moment. Right. So the players now have to take on this load of like, 
yes, I have to make these decisions, but I'm going to be judged if I come back and start playing again, because people will say, I just want the money and I'm bending over for, you know, these owners and blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, if I stop playing, there's the pressure of, Hey, a lot of people are losing their jobs now because I decided to do this. I mean, from your mindset, you know, you're a, you're a player. How do you handle that type of pressure? What, where do you come? Do you, do you, agree upon it as a player's union or what's the best way to go about this? For sure. You have to communicate. You have to have discussions, players union. Chris Paul has done a, done a great job. Just the fact that they're in the bubble, he had a huge part to play in that and the NBA and the, the whole players association have conference calls, meetings, whatever. And you just have to follow your heart. Honestly, you have to follow your heart as a player and everything you said is true. There's a lot of people that rely on you for um, money, their well-being, to take care of their families. And that can be a lot of pressure. That can be a lot of pressure. And all you wanted to do was play basketball. You know, you just, you dreamt of, of being a basketball player in the NBA as a kid. You didn't dream of, of something like this happening and you being on the forefront and everybody looking at you, your next move, having to boycott a game. That's, that never came into these players' mind when they were younger. So you have to follow your heart. You know, for me, if I'm in a situation, I pray about it. Obviously, you guys know my faith is is everything to me and, and um, my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I pray about it. You know, I pray about it and, and I get a peace from that. Um, you have to talk to your family members, the people in your corner, hopefully – if you're an NBA player, you have great people in your corner, uh, people you look up to, people that are going to be real with you and tell you the truth. And you have to confide in them. You have to reach out to those people. Isolation is awful in, in this kind of situation, in any situation, really. I think we're built as people to be in community and do life together and talk to people and get people's input and have good counsel older people I'd reach out if I'm a player I'd reach out to the oldest person I know the person with the most wisdom that I can find that's been through the most situations that maybe lived through the worst of this you know or or way worse than it is now when it comes to racism and pick their brain pick their brain on the subject you know I've I've been able to do that I've learned from a lot of old wise men that couldn't go to certain restaurants and had to go to the colored water fountain, those kinds of people. I want to hear from them. What do you think we should do? Pick their brains, you know, don't make the decision on your own. It's too, it's too emotional right now. We're all too emotional to make a decision on our own. It has to be together. And so that would be my advice to NBA players. Don't make the decision on your own. Pray about it. Consult everybody you can, all your friends, your family. Let's, let's take advantage of the community we have around us. And we need each other now more than ever. It has to be together. I, I really like how you put that. Um, Kalena, thank you for joining us on, on short notice. This was breaking news. And thank you for kind of navigating your frustration, your anguish, and, and what this must be like um, for players. Thanks for putting us in, in those shoes. Um, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? No, that's it, man. That's it. I'm, I'm, <laughs> no, I think I'm, that was I'm, pretty I'm, exhaustive. Uh, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that, was, that was good. I appreciate you guys having me. It's good to see you both. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kalena. And thank you guys for listening to the Run and Plays podcast. 